Hi there, it's David with St. Cards, and I am so excited to share with you the Monastic and Clerics regular expansion in this unboxing or unbagging tutorial, whatever you want to call it, uh, where we're going to take a look at what is inside the black bag for the Monastic and Clerics regular expansion, and then also talk through what these new six orders do on the purple game mat. And before we go into the Monastic and Clerics regular expansion, I will note that you will need to have the purple game mat to enjoy the fullness of this expansion. And you'll find this purple game mat by purchasing the Mendicant Order expansion. Or you can also take a look at the video for the Mendicant Order expansion uh, by uh, taking a look at it at the end of this video. Or you can go and search for it uh, right now and take a look at it first before you take a look at, at the Monastic Order. But all that to say, let's take a look at what's in the black bag of the Monastic and Clerics Regular Order expansion. Inside, you're going to find a rule sheet but you're going to want to unfold, and we'll talk through this here in just a bit. And then you're also going to have uh, 53 brand new saint cards on one side, and then uh, 36 treasures on the other. Uh, for those of you that are seeing this for the first time, yes, this large yellow jewel is a yellow diamond, and it's worth 100, and you're going to need a lot of them uh, whenever you're playing with the Monastic and Clerics Regular Order expansion. So inside of the Monastic and Clerics Regular Order expansion are six new orders. We've got Benedictines, we've got Jesuits, we've got Camaldolese, Carthusians, uh, we've got Cistercians, and then we've got Redemptorists. And we're going to talk through what each of those six do whenever you play them on the purple game map. Uh, for gameplay, you can play it, uh, actually you can just play with these 53 if you want, but we find that it's more enjoyable to, to mix it in with, uh, one of, uh, with your base game. Uh, so uh, if, if you take a look at the base game, that second number at the bottom right hand corner is going to just say one and you're going to want to line up all of those. So if you have a stack of sync cards, you want to just find all the cards that are in the base game. Uh, you look at that second number uh, in between the one on the left and one on the right and it'll say the number one and that's how you find all of the cards in the base game. So you're going to want to take the base game and you're going to want to mix it up with the Monastic and Clerics regular order expansion and then set the deck uh, up on the game mat or on the play area, and then make sure you've got your purple game mat here off to the side. Now, if you would like, on this on this first page here, the rules, it's gonna walk you through all the different new rules from the purple game mat. I'm not gonna do that on this video because I've already done it on the Mendicant Order expansion video, so if you wanna uh, have like a little bit of a walkthrough of those rules, go ahead and take a look at that video where I talk about all the different things that you need to add um, into your gameplay experience whenever you play with the purple game mat. For now, what I'm going to do is just draw your attention to the six orders that are emphasized in this expansion. We'll start with the Benedictines and we'll go all the way down to the Redemptorists. So let's get started. The Benedictines are unique in that they are the only saint card that you're never going to actually play on the purple game mat. And you might think, well, why is that? Well, there's a cool reason and I'm going to share that with you here on this video. Uh, the Benedictines are played on the normal play area just as normal. So let me find a few of them for you here. Uh, to get started with here. So we'll start with St. Boniface of Germany, right, to start off with here. And we're not going to play St. Boniface on the purple game map. We're going to play him on the regular play area. Right now, St. Edmund Campion is the turned up card. And I'm going to play St. Boniface of Germany on top of St. Edmund Campion. They've actually got quite a few matches. They're both martyrs, both priests, both religious, even though they're from different orders. And they're both from Western Europe. So they actually have four matches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play St. Boniface of Germany just like normal. Uh, right there on the, the normal play area. Nothing's changed yet, right? Well, I'm gonna gather my four treasures, just like normal, and then I'm gonna take another four treasures, and I'm gonna place them on the Benedictine space, right up here. And that is treasure that's reserved for the next time somebody plays a Benedictine. It might even be you on the same turn if your second card can get you at least three matches per the normal rules, right? So the Benedictines uh, are gathering treasure the more the Benedictines are played, the more treasure is placed on the Benedictine space. And then there are three other orders that are reforms of the Benedictine order. The Camaldolese, the Carthusians, and the Cistercians. They're all a part of this expansion, and they all actually contribute to the Benedictine space because in a way, we're placing treasure back to the founding. St. Benedict of Nursia in the sixth century founded a, a, a amazing order. You could call him the father of Western monasticism. It's a, it's a pretty common term for him, right? You, you could say that the Camaldolese, the Carthusians, and the Cistercians, they, uh, they owe a great deal of thanks 
uh, to the Benedictine order for what they've inherited and what they've reformed. And so anytime you play a Camaldolese, a Carthusian, or a Cistercian, you're also adding to the Benedictine treasury. So the Benedictine sometimes could gain you 10, 15, 20, 25 treasure, uh, depending on how much is there. And so you want to be really strategic on when you play those Benedictines, because if other people are playing Camaldolese and Carthusians and Cistercians, you're going to be getting a lot of treasure for playing your Benedictines. And you'll see exactly how that works here in just a second. Next, we're going to focus on the Camaldolese, uh, founded in the early 11th century by St. Romuald. And uh, St. Romuald is actually in the base game of St. Cards. Uh, but you're going to get a lot of other great uh, Camaldolese saints in this set. So we're going to start off with St. Bruno of Corfort here, and I'm going to show you how the Camaldolese trigger works. And if you're confused and you're like, well, what do you mean trigger on the purple game mat? Take a look at the Mendicant Order expansion video, and that is going to uh, the, uh, the unboxing video, and that's going to share with you what you need to know to kind of know how to deal with the purple game mat. But we're going to play the Camaldolese um, St. Card right here, St. Bruno of Corfort, and any Camaldolese St. Card will do. And then I get to go into my personal supply and contribute up to three treasures to the Benedictine spot, but I have to do at least one. I'm gonna go ahead and do three. So I'm gonna take three treasures and put it there. However many treasures you put there, up to three, and you have to do at least one. In this case, I did three. I get to draw three cards and I get to bring them into my hand. Now the next thing, so Kamala Lee's, you know, is making a contribution to the Benedictine order. Then it's also drawing cards into your hand. And then what's cool about the Kamalalese is you actually get to play another card for free on that turn. Uh, so you're not uh, using your, you're not playing for the second time, or even if this card was my second card for the, for the turn, I could play another card if I wanted to. And keep in mind, you don't have to play one of the three cards you drew. You could play another card from your hand. You could even play an enrichment card. Uh, which is a cool bonus with the Kamalalese. Otherwise, you'd have to use your entire turn for an enrichment card. In this case, you could play here, pay a little treasure, get some cards, and also lay down uh, an enrichment card. So the Kamalalese and enrichment cards work really well together. Uh, then, uh, once that's done and you've gone ahead and played again, then that Kamalalese trigger is finished. Next, we're going to cover the Carthusians. And one of the things I love about the Carthusians is that Vincent Carducci, the famous artist, was commissioned to draw these beautiful pictures of the Carthusians. And so you're gonna find those all throughout this set. And that's one of the things I love uh, the most personally about uh, the, the process of putting St. Cards together is doing all the research with the art. And in this case, we have a huge commission that's given to a painter that uh, did an absolutely beautiful job uh, painting the prominent uh, men that were a part of this order back in the 11th, 12th, in this case, 15th and 16th century. And so anytime you uh, play a Carthusian saint, uh, there's another con contribution that you're gonna be making to the Benedictine order because of course this is a reform of that, right? So for the Carthusians, let's take St. Hugh of Lincoln as an example. If I play St. Hugh on the Carthusian space, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna turn over the top card and I'm gonna compare that card with St. Hugh of Lincoln. Now the top card is of course the top of the draw deck. And if you're familiar with the Mendicant Order expansion, you may already be thinking about that ability that the Trinitarian has. This is the exact same ability with, with a little bit of a difference. So St. Hugh of Lincoln gets played on the Carthusian space. I'm going to take the top card and it ends up being St. Benedict Biscop. Um, and uh, he is from the seventh century. And I'm going to note the difference in the centuries. The difference in the centuries is five. So I'm gonna take St. Benedict Biscop. I'm gonna put him underneath St. Hugh of Lincoln and I'm going to gain five treasure from the storehouse. And then I'm also gonna take the same amount of treasure that I received, and I'm gonna place it on the Benedictine space. Now keep in mind, if a wild card's drawn in that scenario, then uh, the wild card counts as the first century, so I would get 11 treasure. Or if it was the 20th century, I would get eight treasure. However many treasure I receive is how many treasures go onto the Benedictine space. And you can already see in this tutorial, and by the way, this would this St. Benedict Biscop would go underneath St. Hugh of Lincoln and it would stay there for the rest of the game. You can already see that even in this example, we started off with just a few treasure on the Benedictine space, but now that we've played a Camaldolese, now that we've played a, uh, a Carthusian, now the, the amount of treasure on the Benedictine space is going up. So let's say I play that card and then, then my neighbor, uh, it's their turn, and they play a Benedictine. They would get to receive their treasure as normal plus all this treasure that's been collected. So you could say that uh, any of these cards that are played are really benefiting uh, 
uh, any Benedictine that's played throughout the game. Next, we're going to cover Cistercians. And Cistercians are unique in that it requires you to pay five treasures into the storehouse to be able to play one. And the reason why, it will be apparent here in just a minute. But St. Alice the Leper is a Cistercian. So I'm going to take her and I'm going to place her on the Cistercian space. Now I'm going to take five treasure and I'm going to place it on the Benedictine space. And that is, in a sense, the payment that I have to uh, pay, but it's really kind of a, uh, an ingrained debt that the Cistercians owe to the Benedictines because, of course, the Cistercians are a reform of the Benedictine order. And so that five goes on the Benedictine space as an acknowledgement of the relationship between the Cistercians and the Benedictines. And then you're going to draw five cards into your hand. And you can bring them into your hand. You don't have to just choose from here, but the next thing you're going to do is you're going to give one of these cards away to another player. So I'm gonna get this card and I'm gonna give it to this player over here. Then I'm gonna take another card and I'm gonna put it on top of the deck. Let's see, I know I'm gonna play a Trinitarian next or I'm gonna play a Carthusia next and I wanna know what the card is on the top of the deck, so I'm gonna put this one on the top of the deck, right? And then you have an option, you don't have to do this but you have an option to cloister cards in the Cistercian Monastery. And for every card you cloister, you get three treasure. Now you may not want to do this. You might have some cards you want to do something different with later, but this is a cool way to acknowledge the cloistered reserve life that the Cistercians have. And so I'm going to do that. I've got two cards here. I'm going to take two cards and I'm going to cloister them underneath the St. Alice the Leper Saint card here. And then I get to receive six treasure because I cloistered two cards, three treasure for each card. So there's a, quite a few mechanics there. It's all laid out and spelled out here in the rules. So if you have questions about how that works, you can reference it right here. And we recommend just taking this reference sheet and setting it to the side of the play area there. So you play a Cistercian, you pay five into the Benedictine spot, you draw five cards, you, uh, you take one and give it away, you take another one, put it on top of the deck, and then you can cloister up to two more in the Cistercian space, and that's the Cistercian card. Next, we're going to talk some Jesuits. The Jesuits are here, and they are certainly the cleric's regular part of the monastic and cleric's regular uh, expansion. So in this case, I've got St. Roque Gonzalez de Santa Cruz. If I play St. Roque Gonzalez de Santa Cruz right here on the Jesuit space, there's a, several things that trigger. The first thing is everybody at the table gets to look into their hand and acknowledge whether or not they have a pope in their hand, the Bishop of Rome. If they do, they must show that to the rest of the table, and they get to receive three treasures for every pope they have in their hand. Why is that? Well, the Jesuits were the pope's right-hand men in the 16th century whenever they were founded. Uh, many times they were called the black popes because of how intrinsically they were tied to the Holy Father. So this is a cool way to acknowledge that in the game of Saint cards. So if you have a pope in your hand, you can raise your hand and show it to everybody and say, I've got a pope or I've got three popes. You get three treasure for every pope you have in your hand. The next thing you get to do is you get to go into the deck and you get to look for a pope. In this case, I don't have any popes, so I didn't get any treasure, but I'm going to go ahead and get St. Peter the Apostle, which is a super cool saint card uh, for a lot of reasons, um, into my hand. Now, I don't get three treasure for having that now. It has to be before I go digging for a pope, but I get to go into the deck and find any pope that I want and put it into my hand. So as the game goes on, the more popes you collect, the more benefit you can have whenever a Jesuit's play. Make sure whenever you go to look for a pope that you shuffle the deck thoroughly uh, before moving on with gameplay. You should not know what's on the bottom or the top. Make sure you give it a good shuffle up uh, and, and then place it back. And the last thing you're going to do when you play a Jesuit is you're going to take three treasure from the storehouse, not from your personal pot, but from the storehouse, and you're going to give it to a player. You have to give it all to one player. So uh, I'm going to give it to my neighbor here to my right. And uh, when you do that, you get to draw another card. So there's a lot of things that happen when you play a Jesuit. You check for popes, make sure that everyone's got their treasures for the popes they have in their hand. You get to go digging for a pope. If there's no pope in the, in the, in the, um, in the draw deck, you can't go into the discard pile. If there's no, if there's no pope in here, uh, you don't get to take advantage of that um, for, for playing the Jesuit, but most of the time there's a pope in there, uh, one or two or three to choose from. And then you're going to take three treasure from the storehouse, give it to another player, and then draw a card. And that happens every single time you play a Jesuit on the purple game map. And finally, we have our Redemptorists. And of course, if you've got the base game, you've already got St. Alphonsus Liguri, you've got St. Gerard Magella, uh, and in the, this expansion, you're going to get several more Redemptorists. And what's cool about a Redemptorist is that you're, in a way, inviting somebody over to adore Our Lady. 
Uh, of course, the devotion to Our Lady of Perpetual Help uh, is credited to the Redemptorists. Uh, they really help to emphasize that devotion. So now I'm going to play St. Peter Donders on the Redemptorist space. So what happens? Well, whoever I'm playing with, whether it's one person or if I've got several folks, I'm going to pick one person and they get to look in their hand and get to play one of their saint cards on top of Blessed Peter Donders. However many matches they have, they get to receive that treasure and I get to receive that treasure. So there could be two matches or four or sometimes six or seven matches. It could be quite a few matches, uh, but you share in that in the same way that we share in our devotion to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And many times that prayer is prayed on Tuesday uh, mornings uh, or anytime on Tuesday. Uh, and so for the Redemptorists, that's a very, very precious devotion. And we want to uh, kind of uh, invoke that sense of community whenever we play a Redemptorist here. The next thing that you can do after that happens, so let's say somebody plays, a, a you know, let's say, let's say they play St. Stephen the Chatillon uh, here, and we've got one, two, three, three matches. They would get three treasure. I would get three treasure. And then the next thing I get to do is I get to go into my hand. I don't have to do this if I don't want to. But I can pick a player, and it doesn't have to be the same player that I just did this with, right? Uh, and trade with them. I can take one of my cards. They may not see my card as I lay it down to pass it over to them. And same thing as they pass over a card. They have to trade back to you, right? So you trade a card with them. They trade a card with you. And this is a really fun component in the game. Maybe there's a, a you know combos that you're hoping for or different things that you're trying to move around. Uh, the Redemptorist will help you do just that. So when you play a Redemptorist, as review, uh, you're gonna pick a player, they're gonna play a card on that. They have to leave their card there. Uh, after they play it, you guys each get the, the, the treasures for the matches that are found. And then if you want to, you can trade one of your cards with anybody there at the table. And if you, whoever you choose has to take one of their cards and trade with you as well. And that's the Redemptorist. So all that to say, those are the six orders from the Monastic and Clerics Regular Expansion in the Black Bag. Thanks for your attention as you watch this video. And to find out more about all the Religious Order expansions, you can take a look at the Dominican Order expansion as well as the Religious Booster Deck. Thanks so much for your attention. Take care.